So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie, for um, agreeing to present your wonderful uh, research with us and sharing your research with us. Today we are looking at knowledges, and uh, so you're gonna, uh, your paper is going to be about bird life. Um, and I'm going to give a brief introduction. Charlie Budd currently works at the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds as Caribbean Territories Program Manager. Charlie's interest in wildlife began at an early age when his father used to take him for walks in the UK, nature reserves on family holidays. The sound of a curly, a, a large wading bird with a long curved beak has an extraordinarily evocative call and hearing these at dusk during walks with his father along the Anglesey coast is one of uh, his earliest memories. Charlie solidified his interest in natural history with a degree from the University of Essex in biological science and ecology in 2005, and then specialized in ecology, evolution and conservation at Imperial College in 2007. With volunteering prior to, during and post university, Charlie has around 20 years of nature conservation experience. And uh, prior to um, rejoining the RSPB in 2018, Charlie spent seven years at BirdLife International, the world's largest global conservation partnership of grassroots NGOs, overseeing a partnership between CEMEX, a global cement company, and BirdLife, focused on developing conservation projects uh, of mutual value to BirdLife partners and CEMEX operation. In his present role, Charlie's focus is to support conservation partners and government in the British Caribbean territories of Anguilla, the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Montserrat, and Tusk and Caicos. The work of the Caribbean team includes defending key sites for nature, saving globally threatened species from extinction and influencing in environmental governance. Okay, thank you again, uh, Charlie, over to you now. Well, thank you very much, Marina. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to your fantastic event. It's a pleasure to be able to be here and talk to you about this topic. Um, so it's broadly split into two areas and hopefully you haven't seen too much of the, the former. If, if so, I'll, I'll spin through it really. It's just setting the, the scene about the uh, the twin climate and nature crisis that that we are in globally <clears throat> as marina said my my focus at the present time is working to uh, three partnerships uh, to save nature in the caribbean territories so we'll kind of go from the the sort of bigger picture issues and some issues in the uk um over to what's going on in the caribbean and what we're we're doing to to help so let's just see if i can um get the slide control to work So yeah, this is broadly what I'm going to cover. So I'll tell you a little bit about the RSPB um, and then uh, get into some of the work that we're, we're doing. And um, although um, I, I guess the, the event emphasis on knowledge and, and research, we the emphasis here is more on the kind of practical applications of um, the research, but fundamentally um, it's knowledge and research that underpins what, what we do. So just briefly a little bit about um, where I work. Uh, so, it's the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, or RSPB for short. We're the largest conservation charity in Europe, and we have just over, we have about over a million members. We work across the UK, it's the bulk of our work, but also the 14 UK overseas territories. Uh, and of course, with BirdLife International, uh, the big, biggest global partnership for nature that we work across the African uh, European flyway. Uh, we also work in, um, in Southeast Asia and West Africa as well on forest conservation. Um, birds, yeah, it's in the name, uh, in, in the branding, but we do more than just birds. We protect and restore habitats, we save species, uh, and particularly in the Caribbean territories, we focus on the most threatened species, the species most in need of help. And we work to help in, in the nature and climate emergency and try to inspire others to do the same. And our vision is a world where wildlife, wild places, and all people thrive. So just some kind of bigger... Uh, picture contact. Let me see if I can just minimize the uh, this thing here. That's a bit better. Um, so WWF have been doing the Living Planet Index um, for some time now, where they they sort of set a, a baseline really of um, the health of um, the planet uh, of 1970. The the index being one. Um, 
at that at that time and basically how um, how species around the world have, have fared since then and the sort of headline message is that the, the 4,000 species that have been monitored since 1970 um, have have declined overall by by 68 percent so um, the the kind of big picture is is bleak really when it comes to species survival and you know many of you may have picked up on on some of this through um, through the media there's a few Guardian headlines fairly stark warnings about um, what biodiversity uh, loss could mean for for humanity um, and also uh, the how kind of it interfaces with the climate crisis so you know the loss deforestation is a major contributor to um, the global climate crisis and of course is a massive driver of biodiversity loss and I'll come to sort of where that interfaces with with us in in the UK and in in, in Europe in terms of our contribution um, and this crisis is is ongoing and I, and I think given the uh, the Caribbean focus I've just put in a, an example there from the independent um, about a bird that was feared extinct a few years ago um, following Hurricane Matthew um, which hit um, previously and this was with a very small population and, and, and small isolated populations of species that are localized in just one place highly vulnerable to um, big events like hurricanes that the Caribbean is, is subject to. I won't dwell too much on this one but it's just to kind of give an indication really of um, some of the different drivers for um, the, the biodiversity crisis, the, the, the loss of nature. So obviously land use change, loss of habitat primarily is, is a really big one. The direct exploitation of species, climate change is, is way up there and pollution is also very important. Um, invasive alien species is also very significant and that's a big, um, that's a big one for us in the, sorry, in the um, Caribbean territories and something that we're working to, um, to address. It's a big issue on, on remote islands, invasive alien species. Um, I won't dwell in too much on what's going on on the right, but um, again, this, this, is, this is from the, um, um, many of you might have heard of the inter, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I'm not sure if as many will have heard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is very similar, but they basically collate all the, the science and information about the, the state of the world, um, the state of biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services um, on a, I think it's an annual basis, and this is the, the most recent one I think that I got hold of, um, and it's available online if anyone wants to have a, have a deeper dive. This is just from the summary report. But it gives a, a picture of just how much natural ecosystems have declined. So 47% um, on average uh, for the period covered. Um, and the species extinction risk um, is also, um, I think, yeah, 25%. So it's an extraordinary high proportion of species that are at risk of extinction. I won't go into the others at this point. Um, and then just sort of this is a more of a UK focus um, really, and sorry if this is a bit bleak, but it will get more positive um, as, we, as the talk goes on. Um, but yeah, 15% of species in the UK, in Great Britain are, are threatened with extinction. Um, unfortunately, 133 of 8,000 assessed have already become um, extinct. And this is from the, the State of Nature report, which RSPB um, produced in partnership with, uh, well, quite a wide range of partners actually were involved in this. It comes out every couple of years and is available online. There's a link in the bottom right hand corner there. For anyone interested. Um, but yeah, just a small positive, again, this is from the summary, um, even though despite all of this, um, the time that's been donated by volunteers has increased uh, significantly since 2000. Um, that's been quantified financially, at sort of 20 million pounds a, a year, and, and increasingly um, people are submitting biological records. So if you're asking about just, just recording on um, apps like um, iRecord, for example, iNaturalist can, can contribute to our understanding of how the natural world is, is changing. Um, and then in terms of our, in the UK, our, our kind of impact on, on nature around the world, this is a, a report called Risky Business that some colleagues of mine were involved with um, a few years ago. It's kind of co-produced with WWF and, um, uh, sorry, I forget the name of others, but I think it's principally with WWF and RSPB, but I'm sure there are others involved and um, I can. Um, and it essentially focused on our, impact overseas really so the the products that we import the products that we we use so the actual um, footprint of land overseas that's required to meet our timber demands our demands on palm oil pulp and paper beef and so on just between 2016 and 2018 so the total 
um, annual area required to meet those demands was 21 million hectares. And that's the equivalent of the area of um, Great Britain and Northern Ireland that's coloured in there. And you can see by proportion, um, just the, you know, the equivalent areas of, of Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland that's used for these different, um, different commodities. So timber is obviously a big one, beef and leather is way up there. Um, but it really, I, I thought the infographic really kind of paints, um, you know, a neat picture of how, you know, even though we're kind of, may think of the crisis and, and a lot of biodiversity being over there and, you know, most of the biodiversity is in the rest of the world, actually, for those of us that are based here, it, um, you know, we, we are impacting the natural world in, in, the rest, in the rest of the world in quite a significant way, just through patterns of consumption. Um, and there's also significant impacts in terms of climate change there with, um, you know, 28, circa 28 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, emitted as a result of um, our, dem our demand for just four of those commodities, cocoa, palm oil, rubber and soy. Um, so this is kind of the big picture stuff. And I'll, I'll kind of touch on um, some of the issues in the Caribbean briefly before sort of dive, diving into what we're, we're doing there, just to, just to give some specific examples of how we're, how we're trying to help. But if we were to talk, if I was to talk about what everything the RSPB is doing, um, yeah, we probably need you know, the whole day really to get through that. But for the UK overseas territories at least, um, this just gives you an idea really of, um, this is about uniqueness, the uniqueness, the uniqueness of species. So in the United Kingdom alone, there are, um, 90 unique British species, so species that are only found in the UK, whereas in the, the UK overseas territories, there are nearly one and a half thousand species that are found nowhere else in the world. So that's 94%, 94% of the unique British species um, are in the overseas territories, which is why um, we work in, in the overseas territories. So we can click through, and here they are just briefly. Um, so from out east, British Indian Ocean Territory through to Pitcairn, Pitcairn in um, the, the South Pacific, and obviously the cluster uh, in the Caribbean, which is my, my own focus, which I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so to kind of info, in terms of like the knowledge aspect and science, we, we commissioned this work um, a few years ago to basically look at um, yeah, how much nature is in the, the overseas territories and, and how, you know, how much of it is, is threatened. So 28,000 species were recorded of which um, one and a half thousand were known to be only found in the British territories, i.e. endemic to them. Uh, and of those, um, 145 were assessed against how, how threatened they are against the red list. The red list, the ICN red list is essentially a, a means of quantifying how, how threatened a given species is. So um, species that are considered least concerned, we, as conservation organizations, we don't worry about so much because they're, they're deemed to be doing okay. And at the other end of the scale, you've got critically endangered. So they're right on the edge of, of extinction. And what the RSPB focuses on in the overseas territories are the species that are critically endangered, endangered or, or vulnerable. And we try to work to save them. Um, and then of these endemic species, 111 um, of them are, are globally threatened. So a high proportion of those endemics are, are threatened. So a lot of work to do to try and stop them from going extinct. This is sort of the, the lens or the, the framework that we have for um, uh, working in the UK overseas territories in, in summary, really. So we work to save the most threatened species, the most important sites for nature. We try to um, influence and inform good environmental governance, the policy, uh, and a core part of what I do is, is about building the capacity and strengthening our partners uh, in the overseas territories. And we, you know, technically we don't have a sort of what, you know, what you might call a license to operate in the overseas territories. There are, there are um, nationally recognized uh, NGOs. They tend to be national trusts, for example, Nas Anguilla National Trust, National Trust of the Cayman Islands. So, um, you know, our ability to work in the territories really depends on our relationship with them and their, and so we have, you know, we have solid relationships with, um, with our NGO partners and government partners. And we, um, we work to support what their priorities um, we work with and, and through them. Um, and this just gives an idea really of how much biodiversity is in the, the different territories. You, it's kind of very much skewed towards St. Helena, which is in the South Atlantic, um, which has over 500 um, endemics and that's up in the cloud forest and in the, in the mountains. But that's not to take away just, um, you know, the, the, the combined importance of, um, of the Caribbean territories. You can see they, you know, across, across the board, there is um, a large number of endemic species there. So into the second part, really, so to talk about the, um, the work that, that I do, the work that the team does, um, which is really about um, building and working 
within three partnerships for nature in the Caribbean UK overseas territories. Uh, and this is one of the um, incredible wetland sites uh, of Anguilla in the picture there. So here's a Caribbean, it's a very old map. Um, just to, I'm sure you all know where it is, but it's got the greater and the lesser Antilles there. And then here we have the Caribbean overseas territories. So Cayman Islands in the west, there's the cluster of the Eastern Caribbean um, overseas territories, BVI, Anguilla and Montserrat, and the Turks and Caicos. Um, so there are, around the world, there are a set number of, um, or defined rather, number of um, what, they, what are referred to as global biodiversity hotspots, which is where you have very high concentrations of, of life on Earth. Um, so the Amazon is obviously a very well known one, tropical forests of Africa, West Africa, um, the forests of Southeast Asia. Um, but the Caribbean and the Caribbean is one of these, these hotspots, you know, very, very high diversity um, and endemism uh, of, of life. We um, have zoned, in, I mean, we've zoned in on, we did, we did a, a sort of series of exercises to kind of look across all these threatened species and see where we can make a difference, where through our expertise and our resources, we can add value. Um, you know, where others aren't already working, and we sort of zoned in on a list. I think there's more like 100 really in the long list. There's 15 sort of current priority um, herptiles, so reptiles and amphibians that we're focusing on. And um, um, so Turks and Caicos, rock iguana is a, is a major one. We have a big program as the sister islands, rock iguana, not, not pictured, which is in the Cayman Islands. Um, we've got ambitions to do more for Anagada rock iguana. Um, I think Zombrero amoeba is on the list, although um, I think others are doing work on, on that one now. There's possibly an old slide. So just to kind of um, give you a bit of a flavour of um, the some of the, the species focus work, which is led by our, our species teams. This is the Turks and Caicos rock iguana. It's critically endangered. It's only found in the Turks and Caicos. Um, once found, you know, widespread across the islands, but, um, you know, post Columbus and everything since um, really um, restricted to far fewer. So one of the reasons for that is invasive species, so feral cats and rats in particular, uh, and loss of habitat. So it feeds on vegetation, fruits and its scavengers, um, and it's uh, an important revenue generator for our partner, the National Trust, because two of its um, kind of strongholds are, are their sites. And it's, um, yeah, it's a good, it's another good way to kind of add, you know, I think I think in um, you know Marina's brief there was a really interesting insight into the the debate around sort of intrinsic value of of, of nature and uh, and how we how we place values on nature. But I think it's in order to save it, it's good to kind of recognise that nature is, has intrinsic value, but also to try and look at the economic values too to influence other um, decision makers around around saving species. So. Saving the Iguana Islands, here are um, the key actors, the, um, the people involved in the work on, on the ground from, from the trust and from other partners, including, including government. So, um, you know, supporting them, we, we, we work to survey and monitor uh, the, the species, look at how, how we as people are, are impacting on those species through, um, through tourism and developing biosecurity plans. So to keep invasive species out and away from uh, from these sensitive native species, um, doing surveys for uh, invasive mammals and increasing public awareness within the Turks and Caicos about the importance of, of their, their, their own um, native biodiversity and the risks to it. And there's a strong element of capacity building and training through that project. Um, so it's the species team that are also now leading a new project, um, which I don't have slides enough time to get into, um, on the Sister Islands Rocky Guana, where we've We've just recruited a locally from within the Cayman Islands, um, a community outreach officer and a biosecurity officer um, to address the issues for that, that species. So just jumping into some of the sites, the really cool, amazing sites for nature in the Caribbean. This is Dog Island in um, Anguilla, which is probably the most important breeding seabird island in the whole of the Caribbean region. It's a private island, it's privately owned. Um, there was some work done by the RSPB and uh, Fauna and Flora International a few years ago together with Anguilla National Trust to get um, like brown rats um, eradicated off uh, Dog Island. And that's helped to obviously increase the productivity of the breeding seabirds to help them thrive because they're obviously, their eggs would have been uh, been hammered by the, the rats um, before that. And so, yeah, it's, it's the most, it's an incredible, incredible island and our partner is, Work, you know, leading the work on, on biosecurity and monitoring there. Um, I think we, yeah, I understand it is still up for sale. So that's just, uh, it's on the longest really. It's uh, quite a lot of money, but I think quite good value 
in terms of, well, see their value if we could uh, find the resources to buy it. Um, this site is um, an internationally recognized Ramsar site. Ramsar was a, a key global convention about safeguarding weapons, which was, um, uh, yeah, which basically recognizes the most important um, wetlands in, in, in the world. Uh, this is one of them, it's Booby Pond and, and Little Cayman, which is one of the, the sister islands. Um, Amazing habitat on the sister islands too. This is the bluff habitat on Cayman Brack. So looking out to sea from a from a high point. Extraordinary diversity just on this this one elevated bit of cliff face um, into the forest um, behind. Uh, there is a point um, that I'll come to shortly about our work on sites, but I just thought I'd take a break from the um, the harder stuff. Um, and this is again looking out to sea from from the bluff. So really extraordinary habitats and and scenes from. Um, the Caribbean OTs. And this is, yeah, some other work that we, we do, that we've been doing. We um, we bought some land a couple a few years ago um, on Grand Cayman. So this is a, a small parcel of land that is adjacent to an important bird and biodiversity or an internationally recognized area for um, biodiversity on Grand Cayman. Um, so we bought that with the Rainforest Trust and with the local partner, the National Trust of the Cayman Islands. So we're leasing it to them, uh, what's referred to as a peppercorn rate, i.e. nothing. Um, so they, it's then protected. It's it's, it's uh, registered as a, a national trust heritage site, which means it's um, it's fully protected uh, essentially. And we're in the process of trying to buy uh, another parcel just north of of Selena. And we've encouraged or worked with the Cayman government to secure another parcel. So so it's just um, yeah. I mean, there's lots of different ways to protect important places for nature, and um, it's certainly not the cheapest and easiest um, land purchase, but it is, you know, quite effective. Um, and this is in the face of, you know, quite significant development pressure that's been seen on Grand Cayman with, you know, tremendous loss of habitat since um, the 1950s or well, the 1970s in, in particular, when um, um, Cayman sort of moved from being a kind of financial hub to, um, you know, opening up for tourism. <clears throat> uh, and this is us not with, a, with a sign, quite a discreet sign actually tucked away. It's not. Um, you know, we're looking to open up for public access. It's extremely hard terrain to, to walk on that um, rock. Um, you can see in the in the foreground is um, razor sharp and will cut your boots to, to shreds by the end of a short short walk. So it's not um, it's not your typical RSPB reserve, but it's absolutely stacked with um, endemic native plants. Um, and I've only just noticed it looks like there's um, yeah one of the native grand cayman bullfinches over Stephen's left shoulder which um, I can't believe I've not noticed before but that's um that's pretty awesome that's one of the star species uh of the site so um I don't think that's been superimposed oh it has been super sorry that's an image that's another image I was going to say that's uh um that'd be quite uncanny but anyway that is one of the star species there moving on um some of the threats so yeah and on the sister islands this is why we're doing it because you know there, there is poor regulation in terms of um development pressure even on Cayman Brack, it's a bit of a world away from Grand Cayman, it's only sort of 100 or so miles, but um, yeah, far less sort of scrutiny of what goes on, so there's random bulldozing, so that's why we're doing it. Um, and on the left is one of the, the great naturalists of um, Cayman Brack, with um, uh, in amongst, uh, yeah, one of the, the native species, which I shan't name actually, because I'm not sure um, what the age range is of the audience. Um, so, um, moving on again, here we are, wetlands, and um, just to conclude, really some practical work that we're doing. So that was just a whistle stop source and interesting sites. Here's some of the things that we actually do. We, we try and secure funding to um, to save nature. We've got a big project, which is just a month left of a three-year project focusing on, on wetlands and wetlands conservation. Um, here are just a few of the, the cool species that you can find um, in the Caribbean wetlands. So snowy egret, uh, white-cheeked pintail on the top there. Um, and this, yeah, as I said, is, is, is wrapping up, but this is one of our sites. It's um, East End Pond in, in Anguilla. There's been a lot of mangrove planting. We've helped to rebuild um, a almost sort of hurricane-proof um, hide um, there. And this is all you know work that's been led by our partner. And they've got some really good um, plans in place now to, um, to keep those sites in good nick um, going forward beyond the life of the project. Um, this is the kind of the headline aims really. So sharing best practice, developing and applying practical on the ground measures, um, to save those sites and promoting um, strengthening policy and practice to secure um, the sites. So there's four sites in focus. This is the our kind of project kickoff meeting that we had in 20, 2019. Um, feels like a lifetime ago actually, but where we just kind of explored 
some of the issues and plans and ideas really around for the, for the different sites. But it's really, really great getting everyone together from the three territories of Anguilla, Montserrat, um, and uh, Turks and Caicos. This was hosted by our partner, Anguilla National Trust. Um, so the ambition really was to, with the money that we had, we couldn't really create a wetland in Montserrat. So we were trying to help them create a framework or enabling framework to, to help them restore the wetlands in Montserrat because they'd all been lost, one through development, one through the volcano that erupted in the 90s. You can see the Lahaf there in the top right there. And the other aspect of this project was to address sand mining in the upper reaches of the valley, which affects the, um, um, the security really for any, any uh, future wetland creation in the lower reaches. Um, and just by serendipity at the end of uh, 2020, there was an, an enormous deluge of rain, uh, which, which fell. No, no one was harmed um, in, in that uh, enormous deluge, um, but it did leave um, a legacy of a wetland. So, um, you know, we had a bit of a helping hand from, from nature. You can see in the big picture in the bottom right, um, quite, a, quite an interesting wetland complex was left. And so our sort of project focus shifted really to sort of, um, expanding, enhancing, and um, you know, securing securing that that wetland that was left behind from from that deluge. Um, and so there's a sort of, I think, yeah, this is a drone footage in the bottom right. Um, and actually, because it's the only one on the island, it's attracting a lot of um, a lot of species migrate from um, South America up through the Caribbean and the northeast coast, and so it's attracting quite a lot of species all, already. So it's adding another sort of what they call a stopover site on the um, on the flyway. Turks and Caicos, so the main focus here was the site called Wheeland Pond on Providenciales, which is the main sort of hub and the sort of busiest island. There was, it was kind of been treated as a, a dumping site really, so it's been a huge effort to clean up public ed education works um, to, um, um, yeah, to kind of raise the profile of the, the value of the site and, you know, encourage people not to use it as a, as a dumping site. And these are uh, two of our, our lead partners, Naki on the left from government, uh, and Della is from the, the trust uh, partner. Um, and that's the, the site. You can see a flamingo. It does frequently get flamingos visiting, and it's smallish numbers, but it is quite a small site. And it's interesting that it's quite it's adjacent to a, um, a community, one of the poorest communities actually on um, on the island. So you know, there's had a strong community engagement of, um, focus that that project. And then the last two sites are in Anguilla Road Salt Pond, important bird and biodiversity area, and East End Pond, which is the one that I mentioned before. So a strong emphasis on sort of monitoring and developing plans to kind of secure secure those sites. So just sort of finally wrapping up, um, this is one of the major threats really to, um, to people and nature in um, the Caribbean overseas territories. This is a, a satellite image of one of the, the two um, record breaking hurricanes that hit in 2017, Hurricane Irma, I believe this one is Hurricane Irma and Maria hit um, and had devastating impacts, particularly in the British Virgin Islands, um, Texas and Caicos, um, Dominican Republic. Um, and so one of the things that, in, and this is obviously, you know, they, become, they are becoming more intense and they are becoming more frequent um, as a result of the, the climate crisis, and um, which isn't too much of a surprise because this was predicted um, decades ago through um, scientific modelling and we are seeing it now in real life. So one of the things that we're trying to do to help really is to work with um, and, you know, advocate for sound um, environmental governance, good governance in, um, in the territories. And one of the things, ways that we, you know, we see an opportunity to um, achieve better outcomes for people and nature in the face of um, such th threats, including, you know, from the storm surges associated with those kind of events is just, is through better planning. So through having, um, you know, better plans that, that recognize sites that offer natural solutions to climate change, sites like mangroves, which can offer, natural defence and wetlands which can soak up stormwater um, so we've been doing quite a bit of work recently on, on promoting that and trying to get the word out um, and so that yeah that takes us through the kind of four pillars really of the work that we do in the Caribbean territories and um, these are uh, the, di the directors all the ladies in the picture are the, the directors of the our Caribbean partners there's six because there's two partners in them in the BVI um, yeah, and yeah it's still there's been a few changes of staff but it's still an all all female cast really of um, of directors of the, the National Trust who are leading the fight for, for nature in their Caribbean territories. And there's me and my colleague, Jonathan on the right and on the left um, pictured. So, um, and yeah, here's a book about birds of the UK overseas territories. And thank you for listening. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Charlie. Muchas gracias, Carlitos, um, for, for your wonderful um, presentation about the work that you do. And I'm thinking here about, you mentioned the intrinsic value of nature and how, how we can value uh, nature and thinking about post-human knowledges that see uh, human nature continuing. So there's no separation. And we can talk, we can talk a little bit more about, uh, about that later on. 